Today, as we come to the table, they were saying the same thing. They're saying, Jesus, you can get there through a lot of different ways. And I believe in Jesus too. And the next question is, which Jesus do you believe in? Because everybody's got one, guys. The New Age has a Jesus. Mormons have a Jesus. Muslims have a Jesus. There's lots of Jesuses out there. I mean, lots of robes and beards. Okay, I'm not being flippant. I'm making a point. People create their own Jesus. But how many Jesuses are there really? There's really only one. How do we know we have the right one? That was her next question to me. She said, how do I know I've got the right Jesus? I said, did any of the others die and resurrect or the one of the Bible? She said, just the one of the Bible. I said, you've got the right Jesus. Through the centuries, people have fashioned their own forms of Jesus countless times. We all desire a Savior. God's placed that desire in our hearts. But if the one true Jesus doesn't fit the mold that we prefer, we have a tendency to go looking for a version of Him that will. Many religions and denominations have been formed as a result of this prideful desire. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. If you really want eternal salvation and freedom right here and now, there is only one source of it. As Pastor Mark will explain in today's message, the true Son of God who died on the cross to pay for your sin is the only one who can provide that salvation. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Galatians chapter 4 as he continues his message, A Child of Slavery or A Child of Freedom. There's going to be such joy and such excitement But what a contrast to those who don't receive Jesus Christ as Lord. It says he's going to turn to them and say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you think, wow, that seems awfully harsh. That seems awfully strong. It's not that God desires that. God doesn't want, the Bible says again, he wants none to perish. He wants everyone in the kingdom. But he he makes the offer. Here's the thing. He doesn't make you receive the offer. He gives you the opportunity to say, no, I don't want that. And that is why we make the appeal. That is why I make the appeal to you today. If you've not been born again, there's such great surprises waiting for you forever in the kingdom of God. Such glory, such forgiveness. But if you don't, there's going to be such shock and such horror at the reality of, I was given an opportunity there in November 2019 at Calvary Chapel in Knoxville, and I didn't make that decision. But it's so important that we do it. And again, when I think about most people not realizing that they're slaves to sin, if you ask the normal person, or whatever that is, are you a slave to sin, right? What, what, it, what, are you a slave to sin? Most people will say, well, no, I do what I want. I run my own life. And, and this is what makes, again, sin so wicked because it blinds us and we don't even realize that we're a slave to it. Listen, if you don't think you're a slave to sin, try to live righteously. Try to live the way the Bible says you're supposed to live. You'll find out in one day, that your slaves said, no, I'm not. I just like to do it. Okay, I hear the pride. I used to be that way. Give it time. And then when you humble yourself and realize that, no, you really can't stop, then you'll recognize, I am enslaved to this. And the only one that can set you free and get you into heaven is the Lord. We think we're running our own lives, but we're not because we're all under the sway of the wicked when the Bible says the only ones that are free are those under Christ. Now we've been set free, and so now we can live for the Lord um, and be free in that. I think this is one of the main reasons many people don't respond to the gospel because they don't even know they have a need. If you tell some people today, hey, do you, do, have you been saved? I remember when I heard that growing up, my first thought was, is saved from what? What do you mean saved? I'm fine. No floods, no emergencies, no car wrecks. But I guess I don't need to be saved. But what you don't understand is, no, have you been saved from your sin? Have you been saved from coming judgment? Because everybody's going to stand before God and face that one day. And so many people don't even know that they're going to stand before God and face that judgment. Therefore, they don't know that they need to be saved. And I think oftentimes we need to be able to let people know that you have a need. They need to understand that, yes, your life is not pleasing to God. You need to be rescued from that life if you want to go to heaven. Again, I refer to bumper sticker theology, which, by the way, I don't recommend. But you'll see these bumper stickers ever so often, right? And one that I've used with you guys before, but this just really sums it up. You'll see that born okay the first time. 
We weren't. We weren't. The problem is the Bible says, no, you weren't born. We, we were born horribly flawed and with sin running through our veins, unable to get to heaven. And unless something happens to change that by being born again in the spirit, we're not going to get to go to heaven. And so this is why Paul is going to make this very point today, reminding the Galatians they're either going to live as children of God through what Jesus has done or be lost eternally as slaves to their sin by trusting in the law. And so what is the setting here? Remember, Paul's in the middle of his argument. He's used the argument about, you know, hey, you're a child of God right now. One day you're going to be a full heir, but that's like that picture of the law holding you back until you're free. You shouldn't let the law hold you back. You're free now. You're in Christ. And then again, he, he confronts them and rebukes them in uh, verse 10, saying, I'm worried about you. You observe days. You observe months. You observe seasons. You observe years. That is, you're trying to follow the law. And he's saying, I poured all in, this into you. And, and we ended last week with Paul saying, and because I'm confronting you in this on love, and again, Paul a little bit firm because of his passion and his heart for them, now I'm your enemy? Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? See, that's the thing. Every pastor needs to be able to say what the Bible says clearly. And sometimes it may offend your heart. You may hear something I say and say, who? I can't believe he said that. You know? Here's the question. Are you mad at at me, or are you mad at the truth that was revealed in your heart when this was read? Now, if I'm being rude and ugly and, you know, trying to say that it's, you know, I'm, I'm representing God and I'm yelling at you and whatever, and I'm, it's just me, that's one thing. But if I'm simply sharing the word of God and your heart's convicted, that's the Holy Spirit of God, see? And Paul said, guys, all I've done is share the word of God plainly and clearly with you, and now I'm your enemy? That's where he ended last week. And he goes on in verse 17 and says, speaking about these Judaizers, which means those people that were coming in the church trying to make them follow the law. He said, look, they zealously court you. They use a lot of energy. But for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. Now look how wise the enemy is in deceiving within the church. And I've seen this as well. These false teachers actively and aggressively go after you, but not for your good, but rather for their good, which ultimately is bad. They want you to be a part of their group rather than simply a part of the kingdom of God. And they don't seek you out to encourage you to follow the Lord. They seek you out to encourage you to follow them or follow their group or follow their movement. Listen, our job is not to, you know, to try to get everybody you know, to come to Calvary Chapel. Our job is to try to get everybody in the kingdom of God. And wherever God settles them, that's where God wants them to be. We're simply working along with the Lord. Now, there are obvious cults like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness who go door to door. Uh, many of these people never make any effort really uh, among the lost, so to speak. They're not trying to convert anybody because they themselves aren't converted. What they're trying to do is get you to follow their group. You know, they have the, well, the, the Mormons go on their little uh, two-year thing where they go around or whatever and ride their bikes everywhere, and the Jehovah's Witness do the same thing. And what Paul is saying is people like this, and again, this is, he was comparing them. They didn't have Mormons and Jehovah's Witness in this day, but he's saying the Judaizers, are, they're like our modern-day Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses or those that are legalists within the church. And he said, they're zealous. I mean, you got to admit, these guys are very zealous in what they do, are they not? How many of us are going to get out, you know, every Saturday knocking on doors or ride our bicycle everywhere to go and try to share the gospel? I mean, again, the zealousness that they put forth oftentimes can put the church to shame in what we do as far as outreach. But the bottom line is, is they're not evangelizing to truly get people in the kingdom of God. They're trying to get people to follow their group, again, which is a common trait among a false teacher. They preach to those who are already saved. That's another thing. They're, they go and they try to get the believer to follow their group, if you will. I remember hearing about a, a crusade they were having out in California a while back, and the Mormons will go to the parking lot of the crusade, and when the new believers come out carrying all their materials that they get from, from the, you know, the Harvest Crusade or from some outreach, they'll be standing there waiting to talk and say, look, now that you've made this commitment, let us show you the true way. And they try to pull them away. And so, again, people out there running them out of the parking lot, so to speak, but the bottom line is you can't get rid of all of them. And Paul says, while I want the best for you to see that you're walking with God, they are trying to exclude you from heaven by getting you to leave what Jesus did on the cross and to follow them and their religion, doing all their good works, doing the things they want you to do. And when he speaks of excluding them, this is emphasized in the language, and it means to shut you out. And think about it. They're saying these guys are showing up, to your door, on the street corner, after the crusade, wherever, maybe when the, you share, hey, I went to this Calvary Chapel afterwards, and this guy said, you had to be born again. I don't want to think about that. You ever heard of that? Whatever. They'll try to shut that door and say, that's nonsense. Forget that. Have nothing to do with that. That's ridiculous. Here, come, come. This is where I found truth. 
I spoke to someone yesterday. You know, the new age is not very prevalent here in the South. A lot of people don't know about it. You guys, if you've been coming to Calvary any length of time, you know a little bit about it because we've talked about it some, but it's not a huge issue yet in the South, but it's growing in the South. And basically it's the worship of everything. It's rocks, trees, crystals have power, all these kind of weird things, and it links into all kinds of other stuff that just really gets bizarre. And, and what they try to do is say, look, I found uh, additional things to Jesus. I found things that fulfill and complete that, and they try to pull away believers. And this person has a friend that was trying to pull them away, saying, look, I believe in Jesus too, but it's, it's a Jesus that does all these other things and has all these other things, and there are many ways to get to heaven. You just have to choose the one that works best for you. Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say in John 14, uh, 6, no one goes to the Father except by me? You know, which part of except by me? I had this happen again the other day in the parking lot. Somebody came up to me, and I shared that verse with him. We were talking about it, trying to lead him to the Lord, shared the verse. And the lady standing there with her husband, she, again, I, it, it astounds me. She said, that's just your interpretation. All I did was quote the verse. I didn't, I didn't give an interpretation. I said, Jesus said, no one goes to the Father except by me. I said, what do you do with that statement? Well, that's your interpretation. I said, well, I, if you'll give me a minute, I'll, I'll interpret it, but we hadn't gotten there yet. <laughs> it's just a statement Jesus made. What do you do with that? Is he, is he a liar? And she stormed off, you know, I want nothing to do with you, imperialist Christian. I don't know, she, whatever it was. She ran to her car and jumped in, but her husband stood there. And see, I didn't pursue them. They came up to me. This is weird. This is like... Uh, you know, not having a gift of evangelism, God does strange things in my life. I'm serious. Most of the people that I lead to the Lord make appointments. Can I come see you? And they give their lives to the Lord. I'm like, where were you Sunday morning? Or else, or, or, you know, or they'll come up after the service or whatever. So it just doesn't seem to be a gift that flows, but I do the work of an evangelist. He walked up to me because he liked, you know, my motorcycle. We started talking. But the bottom line is, is that he stayed and listened and realized he had a choice to make. And so the word of God is where the power is. But what these guys try to do is they try to shut you away from that. Get away from that. Don't be so narrow-minded to say that. There are all roads lead to heaven. And this person, again, talking to me about the new age, they were saying the same thing. They're saying, Jesus, you can get there through a lot of different ways. And I believe in Jesus, too. And the next question is, which Jesus do you believe in? Because everybody's got one, guys. The new age has a Jesus. Mormons have a Jesus. Muslims have a Jesus. There's lots of Jesuses out there. I mean, lots of robes and beards. Okay, I'm not being flippant. I'm making a point. People create their own Jesus. But how many Jesuses are there really? There's really only one. How do we know we have the right one? That was her next question to me. She said, how do I know I've got the right Jesus? I said, did any of the others die and resurrect or the one of the Bible? She said, just the one of the Bible. I said, you've got the right Jesus. People, how can we know the Bible's true? How do we know we have the right one? Our Jesus said, I will die and resurrect in three days, and he did it. Their Jesus, they may claim that he did that, but they're going to add a lot more stuff to it. They're going to take stuff away where Jesus said he's the only way to the Father, etc. cetera. Uh, they're not going to use that. And so these guys, he's saying, they try to shut you out. They don't want you to be a part of it. And I think many of them think in their deception they're doing right. But in reality, they're not only missing heaven themselves, they're trying to pull you out of heaven as well. And Paul is saying, have nothing to do with these guys. They're zealous, all right, but they're not zealous for, for you. They're zealous for themselves. Look at verse 18, but it is good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when I'm present with you, in other words, I'm not saying you shouldn't be zealous. Way to go for them that they're zealous, but they're zealous for the wrong thing. You need to be zealous for the things of the Bible, zealous for the things of God. Again, not wanting to follow what they're teaching and what they're doing and their zeal, but what God is doing. And look at this, I love Paul's heart here. And again, this is kind of some of the beginning of Paul softening his message some, and we'll see that more in chapters five and six. He says, my little children, it's a term of endearment. It's almost like a, a little nickname or something. He's basically saying to them, look, I know I've been harsh. I know back in chapter 3, which again, these were letters. They didn't have chapter 3 and verses. It was all written as one big thing. We did that later so we could find our way around. But he would say in his mind and to their heart, I know earlier in the letter, which we know is chapter 3, verse 1, I know I called you foolish. I know I asked, what are you doing? I know I've been harsh with you throughout this letter, but it's because I loved you. And now I want you to know that I do love you. So it's like, little children. You're my family. I, I speak harsh because I love you, not because I don't love you. Speaks of a father to his children or his young baby. Paul's not speaking in pride or belittling them or calling them by calling them little children. Rather, he's expressing his tender love for them as a father. And again, because he'd been harsh. But now you see in the midst of this firmness that Paul is addressing them. That's why, again, they were saying he was an enemy of theirs uh, and for telling them the truth. Now Paul says, look, I'm not an enemy. I love you. you. I feel like you're part of mine. 
I, I gave spiritual birth to you, Paul would say. When I came there and planted the church and invested in you, I presented Christ to you. I poured my life into you. He says, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I labored once for you, but now I'm laboring again for you. How many of you ladies would like to be in labor again for the same child you've already had? It's like once was enough. Well, Paul says, I've got to give birth to you a second time. I've got to go all, through all the contractions, all the labor, you know, you know, all the, or whatever. I've got to do all that all over again, right? And that happens with a new believer. It's like, oh, 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 you know, you're doing this kind of stuff. What are you doing, you know? So there's a real picture here of laboring. He says, I did this once, but here's what I love about Paul. Paul said, I did that once, but I love you so much, I'll do it again. I right now again, he says, again, I'm laboring again to give you birth in Christ. And you think, now I guarantee you, you moms, if you've got a child that's veered away and they're not walking with the Lord or they're whatever their life is, if you could shrink them back down to a little baby and carry them again and start over, you would do it. You would do it. Why? Not because you want to go through all that pain and misery and the whole thing again and all that goes with that. You know, the bottom line is you would do it because you love them so much. And what Paul is saying is, you know what? I've been through all this. I I shouldn't have to go back and, and have labor again. I should be watching the fruit. I should be watching you grow. But because you're the way you are, I am laboring again. And that's why I'm speaking firmly to you because you're off track and I'm trying to get you back. And although you are being foolish, I love you. You're my little children. So stop it and get back in line. Again, uh, Paul showing that love by, by laboring once again, you know, pouring himself into them. And notice he says that he's willing to do it all again, um, uh, but, you know, just because he loves them so much. And then he ends by saying that he, the reason being is he has doubts. Look at verse 20. He says, I would like to be present with you now and change my tone. I know my tone is firm. I'd like to be present and change my tone, for I have doubts about you. And the bottom line is I want to I speak differently, but I, until I know that you're listening... You know, you, you see a child going the wrong way, you're going to speak firmly until you realize you've got their attention because you don't want them to be hurt. You want them to go the wrong way. And Paul's saying the same thing. And I love Paul's heart because, again, as we talked about last week, Paul here, he knows that he's being firm, and now he starts letting them know that he loves them, and that's the heart of a pastor. you got to deal with it, but then afterwards you're like, ah, I hope I wasn't too firm. You know, then he does the same thing, 1 Corinthians. He like, bam, 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 bam. 2 Corinthians, oh, I know that I was kind of tough, but look, you guys responded, and you came around and all. And that's that whole parental guidance thing that's going on there and trying to know what's best and what's not best for them. And the heart of Paul, which is, which is wonderful, And Paul here is saying to them, I've got these doubts. That is, I'm questioning your heart for Jesus, and I'm questioning even your salvation. You made a profession of of, of your sin and and asked forgiveness, and you made a profession of Christ. I'm starting to doubt. Was it real? Did it really happen? Listen, when somebody gets born again, or they say they're born again, there should be evidence. If you don't see any evidence. A lot of times people come forward and say, would you pray for my family member, whatever, and, and say, well, do they know the Lord? And a lot of times there's that kind of long pause. Well, that almost answers it right there, by the way. If you have to pause and think about whether or not they know the Lord, probably they don't. Why? Why am I saying that? This is not unbiblical judgment. Again, only God can judge who's going to heaven and who's not. We get that. We're not to judge in that way. But we are able and actually called to make an assessment. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. Why? How else are you going to pray for them? See, when somebody says, I want you to pray for this person, I need to make an assessment. Do they know the Lord? Uh, I say, you know, let's, do, let's pray that they come to know the Lord. Well, I, okay. And why do I do that? First of all, maybe, but here's the bottom line. If you've not seen evidence at some point in their life. Now, look, can a true believer fall away and not be living for the Lord? Absolutely. And they're still a true believer. They're just in sin and God will deal with that. But what about those that you've never seen any evidence? I just, I think, hmm, you know, I've never really seen them ever want to read their Bible. I've never, ever really seen them want to pray. I've never seen them really stand for what's right. I've never seen any evidence in their life at all. We have to be able to assess that in, in a proper way, in a biblical judgment, if you want to use that, or biblical assessment, or biblical fruit inspection, so that we know how to pray and how to reach them. If I say to someone, when did you give your life to the Lord? Well, You know, I kind of grew up in church. Okay, that's good. But when did you give your life to the Lord? Well, I've kind of always, you know, okay, that's good. Was there ever a time where you confessed your sin and turned from it and repented and said, I need Jesus? Well, maybe not really that way. Okay, let's do that. Let's do it that way. And then you see people just, their countenance change. 
And I can't tell you how many times that's happened. And they'll pray and they come out and they're smiling and going, I feel different. I said, you're born again. You're a new creature. You've been forgiven. Now go tell somebody. See, that's how it works. And so we have to be able to do that. And so Paul is basically challenging them saying, look, I'm having some questions as to whether or not all the work that I did, all this stuff, you said you were Christians, you said you were following. I've got doubts about you now because of the way you're doing these things. Then that's why I'm dealing with you so firmly and so harshly. And by the way, there are times where you need to deal with things as a pastor and even as a brother or sister in the Lord, a little bit more firm. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong in that. You know, if you love someone and you've poured your life into someone, you have a right to that. One commentator said it this way. The writer of the New American Commentary, speaking about Paul here and his firmness in this letter, said this. Paul had a right to speak harshly with them because of his great love for them. If you love somebody, you can speak firm to them. If you don't love them, you don't need to be doing that because it's not going to be received. Another commentator said of Paul concerning chapters 5 and 6, right after this, he said, now that he has completed, that is Paul, the more forceful part of his epistle, he begins to feel that he's handled the Galatians too severely. Again, there's that pastor's heart. Being concerned that by his harshness, he may have done more harm than good. He tells them that his severe rebuke came from a fatherly and truly apostolic heart or loving heart, we would say. So you say, well, I don't know that I can go to my friend and tell them. If you see a friend that you're questioning whether or not they're a real believer, they say they are, but you see no evidence, you need to go to them and say, tell me, when did you give your life to the Lord? And, and I'm not saying you need to know the day. A lot of people say, well, if you don't know the day you gave your life to the Lord, you're, you're probably not really saved. I don't know the day I got saved. I remember the time. I remember it was sometime around this time of year in November back in 1988. And I remember my life changing radically. So I know that it happened, and I know the time that it happened. So don't be upset if somebody doesn't know the day or where they were or this kind of thing. The bottom line is, do they know that it happened? Has that true conversion taken place? And that's exactly where Paul uh, deals with them, and that's where we're going to leave it today because my challenge to you is this as we end today. Do you know that it's taken place? Listen, let's settle the issue today. If you have any question. Some people say to me, you know, are you going to heaven? They'll say, well, I, I think so. Not a good answer. Are you going to heaven? I hope so. Not a good answer. The Bible says that God's spirit bears witness with our spirit that we know, that we know him. The word in the Greek is gnosko. It means to know by experience. Nobody can talk you out of it. I'm not talking about a moment of doubt. Every believer can go through periods of doubt, a rough time of life. That happens to the strongest of believers. John the Baptist when he was in prison. Is, is Jesus really the one? Go tell John. Remind him what I'm doing. So even the strongest of believers can have doubt. That's not what I'm talking about. Momentary doubt is called being a human. But if you've never known that you've known him, if you've never been able to say, I know for sure I'm going to heaven, if you have doubts that that's really been done in your heart, you need to settle that issue today. And it's not a matter of me judging you. It's a matter of me loving you and saying it's time to deal with the issue because the day is coming where everyone in this room and on this planet will stand before God Almighty. And we can either stand there with him saying, I got to show you what you have. Just wait. Are you ready? <gasps> or depart from me. I never knew you. And the Bible says we'll be eternally separated from God into, into darkness. And yes, it says everlasting fire. That's what the Bible says. Deal with the issue today. While our time at the table of God's Word is ending for today, please keep reading in the book of Galatians. If you missed any part of this broadcast on Come to the Table or you want to hear it again, visit thewaymedia.net. You can also subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Again, just visit thewaymedia.net, then click on Come to the Table. You can also join us on Facebook. You can get the latest information along with some inspiration and encouragement for your newsfeed. There is a link at thewaymedia.net. Our expository teachings through Galatians touch on good and relevant topics such as faith versus works and how to work through differences like race and ethnicity. Hot topics that are hitting our culture today like never before. On behalf of Pastor Mark, we'd appreciate your prayers during this study. We ask that you pray for our nation, for the culture around us, and that God would work in the lives of followers and those who are yet to follow Him. Please pray that the Holy Spirit would lead those who don't know Him to hear this program so that they can find hope in Jesus. Pray that each listener would have open ears and soft hearts. We know the message of Jesus can transform lives and mend the differences that so many are struggling with. 
So thanks for lifting your fellow listeners up to the Lord. And we hope you can join us as we continue exploring the book of Galatians the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.